record. Okay, are we doing another intro? Um, I'll just do a very, very short intro. Go ahead then. It's all yours. Okay. You're recording? I am recording. <laughs> Go ahead. Cool. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the second part of the Autumn Journal series of episodes. Ooh. Um, today we will be looking at Cantos 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 and 12. Um, and we may as well get straight into it. So the first thing I wanted to look at here is to compare episode, is to compare Cantos 7 and 12 because both of those are on political sort of global events topics mm -hmm. and uh, 8, 9, 10 and 11 less so. So Canto 7 is about, you know, concern over whether or not there's going to be a war and, you know, the assumption that there probably will. Mm -hmm. And Canto 12 is a, is a similar thing, wondering about what to do about this. Um, and, you know, a bit of time has passed. Uh, that Canto 12 is set at the beginning of October. That's when he's writing it. So we'll see how he's how his opinions have changed and yes. how sort of his mindset has changed, if it has changed. So to remind you of this, uh, Canto 7, he's talking about um, your, the, God, <laughs> words are hard. <laughs> so what strikes you about Canto 7, if anything? Um, it's the one that begins uses... conferences, adjournments, ultimatums, flights in the air, castles in the air. That is the one that begins like that. <laughs> um, okay, so he uses the word bacilli, which I am like, okay, sir, science. Um, <laughs> Can you define the bacilli for us? Yeah, it's a, like a rod shaped bacteria, basically. It's a, <laughs> a group of bacteria and okay they're usually gram positive that's all i remember usually the silly <laughs> is you're looking at rod shaped bacteria right yeah merriam webster says it is yes any of a genus of rod shaped gram positive i don't know what gram positive means usually it's, aerobic it's kind of bacteria a stain. it's usually to do with their um their cell wall the thickness of their cell wall so okay. gram positive is going to stain differently to gram negative Right. That's an interesting line, actually. Guns will take the view and searchlights probe the heavens for bacilli with narrow ones of blue. Mm. I'm guessing it must be because they're rod shaped that they're saying that the... Yeah, maybe. The, the, the bombs look like bacilli? Yeah. Yeah. If you imagine like what a typical, um, what would you call them? Yeah, like shell looks like. They're like sort of rugby ball, but bigger. That, that's, yeah. a pretty, that's a pretty good idea of what a bacilli looks like. Right. And the way that we talk about diseases is often using military metaphors. Mm. So now we're talking about military with disease metaphors. <laughs> yeah. We like that. We stand by that. Ooh. I love a disease I mean, you metaphor. Can I mean, yeah, I'm not sure that I like a military metaphor when we're talking about social or, you know. <laughs> no. These, I, I'm not sure that I like talking about uh, medicine with military metaphors, but military with medical metaphors. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I like that. I love a, I love a medical metaphor. Um, but yeah, <laughs> that's obviously stood out to me because I was like, interesting word choice. And I hmm. see, I can see where he was coming from when he used that. Mm -hmm. Like, obviously, my science brain is like, yes, a bacilli. That is what it looks like in my head. Um, yeah. So yeah, I liked that. I thought that was clever. Whereas I had to Google that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, respectable, you know, if I, I suppose I haven't taught you anything or anything, so. Um, but yeah, I, I thought that that was quite clever imagery for me. Um, mm. Although I do wonder how he knew what, what that was. I mean, he's quite he seems quite well well read, doesn't he? Yeah. That so I guess things. it could be I guess it could be quite um yeah, quite common knowledge for him. But 
but yeah i liked that using that word in that context um and then he's also talking about primrose hill which obviously before we were like uh before we were talking about them mounting the the gun on the hill and now they're like they're cutting yes. the trees down and so it's happening it's all happening it's all very yeah real. so before he was basically saying that there might be um a that there might be a gun so so mm -hmm. in stan uh canto five um he says the Dahlia shapes of the lights on Primrose Hill, whose summit mm. once was used for a gun emplacement and very likely will be used that way again. So he isn't saying that it is being used that way. He's saying that it likely will be. Yeah. And yeah. But now it's becoming so a lot seven, more. So seven, it, Obvious. they're cutting the trees down. That is presumably what they are doing. He was proved mm. right, I suppose. Mm -hmm. It's above Bacilli. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and obviously Hitler yells on the wireless, and and so mm. everything's becoming a bit more, um, a bit more real and a bit more wartime esque. Yes, a bit scarier. Yes. But yeah, that's all I really had to say about that. Okay, so I'll make one or two points, mm. just brief um, things that I noticed, and mm. then we can look at. Canto 12 and see how it compares. Mm. So there's a lot of sort of um, juxtaposition between normality and the beginning of the war. That is, for example, in the Sodden Park on Sunday, protest meetings assemble not as so often now merely to advertise some patent panacea, but simply to avow the need to hold the ditch. A bare avowal that may perhaps imply death at the doors in a week, mm. but perhaps in the long run, exposure of the lie. So basically, you've got people, um, you know, with specific political agendas, protesting and, you know, saying their piece. And yeah. usually they would be saying, here is our, here is our belief. Um, it's, you know, it might be the, it might be a political thing, it might be communism is going to save the world or it might be a religious thing mm. you know come to our come to our religion and will and everything's going to be fine you know a panacea yeah. to heal heal the world heal everything mm -hmm. um whereas now they're not doing that now it's changed they're still there but they're now simply saying <laughs> they're now focused on the present moment mm. which is um, so McNeese is uh, comparing what usually happens with what is happening now. Not everything's changed, but something has changed. Right. Later on, um, the, he he lost his dog. So he's talking about that there's going to be a gun on Primrose Hill, and he says. Um, and I found my dog had vanished. And I thought, this is the end of the old regime, but found the police had got to a St. John, St. John's Wood station. So they found it. They found the, um, they found mm. the dog. It's all fine. Well, of course, it's not all fine, but the dog is fine, you know? Yeah. Like there's that kind of juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. And the taxi driver says, it turns me up when I see these soldiers in lorries. And, um, and then it turns me up a coffee, please. I like that line. It turns me up. A coffee, please. Mm. Like, like there's, there's soldiers in lorries. Everything's weird. Anyway, I want a coffee, please. Like it's yeah. Not, it's like it's not. It's obviously not that weird because you've just you've just accepted it into your life as something that's happening now. Yeah, you, you're you're going about your day. Like yeah, it's this juxtaposition between everything's weird. There might be a war, and it's a normal day. I'm going to have some coffee. <laughs> So, and yeah, there's some very sort of dramatic language, the unknown Ubermensch. Um, ah, here's the line about curtains that I mentioned last time. Um, I wonder, from now on, I need take the trouble to go out choosing stuff for curtains, as I don't know anyone to make curtains quickly. Rather, one should quickly stop the, tr stop the cracks for gas or dig a trench. Mm. Like, it's how surreal everything is, right? Yeah. Like, like, why am I worrying about curtains when 
we could be bombed, you know? Mm. Um, but of course, why would you be digging a trench? I suppose you'd be, you might be digging a trench and like, like digging out a bomb shelter, but digging mm. a trench is what you do if you're a soldier. So right. that's kind of a, a slightly surreal, like, like, no, you shouldn't be digging a trench. So maybe an over You're not a soldier, you're not going out. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of, it, may, it almost makes it more immediate, but also more, like, it's taking this thing that realistically is far away and bringing it into your... Mm. immediate life but in a way that's not really all that realistic and so it doesn't feel real the same with the right. unknown ubermensch like mm. yeah the ubermensch is part of nazi ideology but it's at the same time it's part of ideology it isn't you, you don't like your average german soldier is not an ubermensch right, <laughs> you know, you're, not, right. you're not gonna see the ubermensch um, so, you know, the coming of the unknown Ubermensch almost feels unreal because mm. it's not going to happen. It's not likely yeah. to happen. But the war itself is likely to happen, but it mm. doesn't feel real. It's this sort of weird, they're in this weird position, I guess. Mm. So, part. Part 12. Um, is another one wondering about what to do. So seven begins um, with conferences, adjournments, ultimatums. It's very immediate. It's mm -hmm. this is what is happening right now. Twelve begins. These days are misted. Yeah. These days are misty, insulated, mute, like a faded tapestry. Things are. Settled. Things have got quieter. Yeah. yeah. We hardly have the heart to meddle anymore with personal ethics or public calls. Mm. People have not recovered from the crisis. So at this point, I think at this point, it's like, yeah, we're, we're going to be at war. This is um, 12 is the begin. 12 is the first one in that mentions October. Mm. Um, so Stanza seven is firmly in September, 12 mentions October. And so I, I, I can only assume that that's when that October starts at some point here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, that one's so well later on, October. now it is morning again, the 25th of October, but that isn't mm. necessarily when that the first stanza, uh, the first no. like bit of the quatrain, the, the first bit of the canto starts, but. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, this is, again, I mentioned it last time, here, for now they for they say that now it is time unequivocally to act, to let the pawns be taken, that is to take some risks, you know, mm -hmm. in chess the pawn is the least sort of least powerful, I guess, uh, uh, chess piece. So like, mm -hmm. I don't play chess, but you know, your pawns mm -hmm. are going to be taken before you let your queen be taken, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah, he, he says about circuses a lot for bread and circuses, circuses of death, and from the topmost mm. tears, a cataract of goggling, roaring faces. Mm. What do you think about that? Um, I think people have become a bit sort of numb to what the reality of the situation is. Before they were, people were scared, and now it's kind of like people were going about their days, but also it's like when people stop and stare at a car accident, you know, like mm. it's bad, but people still stop and try and look and see what's going on. Um, yeah. I think that um, his use of like Rome and Roman makes me think of like, what are the Colosseum type mm -hmm. situations? And that was all very gory and, you know, they'd have people yes. fighting to the death and that's where you're like, oh, let me look. But like, like morbid, I guess morbid curiosity of people now, now that the reality is set in of all the things that are going on, people are less frightened and more just morbidly curious. Right. Okay. Yeah. It, like, I think also that settled vibe of like everybody's in their rut and they're just going about their business and then they're like oh, oh something weird's going on over there and then they're like yeah okay just get on with my day yeah interesting i think it also suggests that 
because he isn't saying that this is what people are doing. He's saying mm. when we go to Rome, we must do as the Romans do. Mm. I think possibly when the war actually comes. Hmm. Possibly before people were pretending it wasn't happening or treating it, you know, as this strange spectacle that's going on elsewhere. The, mm -hmm. the same way that, you know, he suggests that he was when he was in Spain. Mm. Um, and now he's saying, no, we've got to be, we've got to face it the way that the Romans would face, uh, you know, the gladiators that, like you said, people would watch the gladiators fight mm. rather than r run away and try not to look at it. You right, know? right. Um, possibly that's what he's saying. I'm not entirely sure, but I think that could be it. And yeah, the circus, yeah, I'm not sure about what, what he means with the circuses there. Uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure. I guess you could call crowds of people and like, when the things are really busy and bustling, that could be a circus. But I don't know if that is yeah. true for this particular. I feel like there's definitely implications of like spectacle and yeah. pointlessness. Mm -hmm. Because a circus is sheer entertainment, which kind of has this idea of like a circus of death would then be death for pure entertainment which right. obviously in this case it's not entertainment but it could be for a similar sort of like it's not for a grander purpose yeah, yeah. it's just for the sake of it maybe, maybe that's yeah. what he means mm. um, yeah and also the word a cataract of goggling what is it a cataract of goggling roaring, roaring faces. faces cataract is like obscures vision right like a yes. cataract is like a uh like when your eye part of your eye goes opaque right so yes although having just googled it to check that i did actually know what a cataract was and that i wasn't mm -hmm. misremembering definition two is a medical condition in which the lens of the eye becomes progressively opaque resulting in blurred vision right um definition one is a large waterfall oh interesting i didn't mm. know that so, okay, in the context um, of a waterfall, goggling, roaring faces? Yeah, I suppose the... Like a rush, like a... Yeah, yeah, I think that's rush. how I would put it. Mm. But it would also be, it could be a large sort of rushing force that obscures your vision in some right, way. Right, Even if only metaphorically. Yeah. I'm not sure, but it's an interesting it, idea. It's basically, I feel like, so we've got, yes, it's a lot of people goggling, roaring faces, but yeah, it's, it's going to be a large, we're trying to picture a large amount that's maybe getting in the way of mm. something. Because mm. I feel like, well, even waterfalls, you, like the air fills with mist and you can't see yeah. very far in front of you. So I guess it could have very similar implications. Yeah, and also in terms of the sound, because again, the first first line oh, these days yeah. a misty insulated mute doesn't. If you're right next to a waterfall, that sound insulates you from sounds outside. You can't yeah. hear what someone's saying because you've just got the rushing of the waterfall, the roaring yeah. of the waterfall. To use the the <laughs> adjective he describes, faces. So maybe all this goggling, roaring faces is just so loud and all encompassing. It becomes, you know, it's no longer part of the background. It's consuming you. Yeah, so he's sort of consumed and yeah, like your entire mind is consumed by the by the threat of war mm. and by everybody's knowledge of the threat of war and everybody's reaction. Yeah. Everyone's kind of frantic, yeah. goggling, you know. Right. Yeah. So here, now it is morning again, the 25th of October. He sets it very firmly on a specific date. Right. And, you know, the silent hours grow down like stalactites. And reading Plato talking about his forms to damn the artist touting round his mirror, 
I am glad that I have been left to third best bed and live in a world of error. His world of capital initials, that is Plato's world of the forms, is mm -hmm. too bleak. For me, there remain, to all intents and purposes, seven days in the week, and no one Tuesday is another, and you destroy it if you subtract the difference and relate it merely to the form of Tuesday. This is Tuesday, the 25th of October, 1958. So he's stressing the importance of the present moment mm. and that right now is now and it is not like any other time. Right. Whereas in other places, you'll see him um, collapsing time almost. Mm. Sort of use you know using the past to talk about the present and implying that um oh, oh, the thing about the last um it, you know last time when we were talking about this the stanza about spain or the canto about spain and he says that spain will soon denote our grief mm. this is almost implying the opposite by saying right you know here and now is here and now it isn't all you know every Tuesday is different because yeah. this is Tuesday, the 25th of October, 1958. It will never be that date again. Mm. So yeah. Is there anything else about this that you would want to, any um, other differences between these cantos that you want to mention? Not necessarily between the two, although like you say, the circuses and the sort of, Bustle is a bit more than um, a bit more like the the was it the seventh canto um, mm -hmm. because obviously that's talking a bit more about like action and things being done and you observing change. Mm -hmm. Although I do want to point you've highlighted it here, happy peasant like the noble savage is a myth. Yeah. Um, typically, I would say a lot of people would have thought that peasants were savages. And the nobles <laughs> yeah. were, you know, going about their business. So, um, like, though that combination of words to put noble and savage together, I feel like is interesting to say that. Yeah, is. the noble savage is a phrase um, from literature, especially the romantic writings mm -hmm. of the 18th and 19th century. So the noble savage is an idealized concept of uncivilized man who symbolizes the innate goodness of one not exposed to the corrupting influences of civilization. So if you've read any Rousseau, that's kind of, that's a popular idea in his writing, mm. which, so, you know, Louis needs to say, that's a myth. Like, you know, the people untouched by civilization, which is already a, weird dubious thing to say in the first place mm -hmm. are not inherently innately good in the same way as like right. you know you're I, really you're never going to find someone who is untouched by some form of sort of i was gonna say civilization but even the word civilization we've come to use as like specifically what we call western civilization but every group of people no matter where they live has their own culture it's completely are like it's a a it's sort of a a racist um, idea to even colonial. say like yeah to sort of say oh yeah you know these native american tribes for example are untouched by civilization even if you're using it in a supposedly flattering way to call them the noble savage that is to say that they're innately good because they're untouched by civilization it's like no they are a, a, pe a people with their own cultures just like yeah. ours yeah. um but the happy peasant is kind of a similar idea it's basically the idea that wealth doesn't make you any any happier that you know if you're extremely poor and you've always been poor then you'll be happy with what you have basically which again is a massive oversimplification and mm. because if you are sick all the time or yeah if you're starving like you don't you know, have access to opportunities just because you don't have a lot of money and, mm, you're not going to be as happy you're just going to have to settle for what you've got exactly um and settling for what you've got is like when you're saying like it makes sense to say like oh yeah like 
you know, having more money, having more cars and fancy clothes doesn't make you any happier. And like, yeah, that's true. People are still miserable even when they've got, mm. you know, insane amounts of wealth. And having yeah. huge amounts of wealth isn't going to make you isn't going to make you happy. It's not going to fix your personal problems or whatever. But, yeah, but, but being able if to you pay can't for afford to eat medicine, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly yeah. yeah. But notice um, how it's never. It's always the rich people that say. You know, oh, yeah. money is what causes problems, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, yeah, but you can still afford to to go, you know, to go to hospital if you need to or mm. take a day off work or, you know, whatever. Exactly. So, yeah. And that, so that makes sense. Migny says, not that I would rather be a peasant, you know. Yeah. All I like, would he's like... Aware. He's aware that you wouldn't want to be a peasant. <laughs> yeah. He says, all, all that I would like is to be human, having a share in a civilised, articulate and well-adjusted community where the mind is given its due, but the body is not distrusted. You know, mm. he doesn't want to be super rich, but he also wants to live a comfortable life, you know, not yeah. worrying about money, basically. But so, OK, if we sort of sum up these differences, I'll point out one thing that I think is interesting. Mm -hmm that I think is a more, that I, th that I think is a good note to sort of end this section on, which is that we said that uh, Canto 7 compares, uh, it has a lot of juxtaposition between small details about normal life versus the coming war. Yeah. Stanza 12 uses these bigger ideas, Plato, later on Aristotle, the happy peasant, the noble savage, these bigger ideas, mm -hmm. which to me feels like he is trying to grapple with the political moment and struggling. It isn't, um, not that he wasn't trying to grapple with it before, but it, it's becoming, as, as war is approaching, faster and becoming more real and the situation is becoming more dire and people are saying now is the time to act we have to do something that's prompting him to think bigger to and not necessarily more clearly mm. but to you know once he's being told you need to do something and he's going well, what should i do what do i want to do in general what's what system works oh god <laughs> you know? yeah yeah and so he goes back to the stuff that he's been you know he he's going back to the stuff he studied at university and the stuff that he taught at the university of birmingham which is mm -hmm. um we'll get to in a minute and using that and trying to make that fit but it doesn't work you know yeah he thinks about plato and he thinks about aristotle and he thinks about these ideas like the happy peasant and the noble savage and then just goes and, and, and can't um, reconcile. put them together. Yeah. yeah, he can't reconcile all of these big ideas with the reality of what's in front of him. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, should we move on to Canto 8 and sure, Canto sure. 10, which are both related to education. So I wanted to go over that with you. Mm -hmm. so, eight. <laughs> what every time i like put my cursor up here to change the tab this comes down and then i have to wait for it to go away i can't see anything so <laughs> oh okay <laughs> so now you just like 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 a silly person <laughs> um, well, um, okay so yeah um Canto uh, 8 is about his time teaching classics in Birmingham, the University mm -hmm. of Birmingham. Right. And Canto 10 is, um, tells some of his memories of his time at school. So it'd be interesting to compare these. Mm -hmm. So Canto 8 begins the same way a lot of, his, a lot of these cantos begin, uh, about the weather. <laughs> Yeah. Sun shines easy, sun shines gay on bug house, warehouse, brewery, market. It's another list. I was just saying, doing that describing thing again. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so he lists various places, the Chocolate Factory, the Greek Town Hall, mm -hmm. and names a few places, Josiah Mason, the Mitchells and Butler's, and Butler's Tudor pubs. Um, so it's a similar thing, it's a similar idea of cataloguing. And these, this catalogue gives way to, he remembers eight years back when he lived in this hazy city, that's Birmingham. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, so eight years back, he would most likely have been, yeah, at this point, he would have been married to uh, his wife, his ex-wife, mm -hmm. and teaching classics. He says, to work in a building caked with grime, teaching the classics to Midland students, Virgil, Libby, the usual round, principal parts and the lost by Gamma, and to hear the prison-like lecture room resound to Homer in a Dudley accent. <laughs> <laughs> it is quite a funny image um, and it is quite interesting to hear this uh, juxtaposition again there's so much juxtaposition in this in this poem mm. between very highbrow fancy things principal parts in the lost eye gamma that's about greek and latin right. um, grammar the lost eye gamma specifically is to do with um, a letter that was initially in the ancient Greek alphabet and gradually stopped being used. And um, so that is about the history of the language. Mm -hmm. And principal parts are a, the basic form of a verb. So students would have to learn the principal parts of, um, of each verb in order to be able to conjugate them. Right. Both Greek and Latin grammar are awful. I hate them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Virgil is a Roman writer. He wrote the Aeneid and Livy is a Roman historian. And yeah, there's the contrast between that and the building caked with grime. Mm. And the idea Prison of reading -like Homer. Lecture room. <laughs> yep. And the idea of reading Homer, so the author of the Iliad and the Odyssey, mm -hmm. in a Dudley accent. Mm. Um, it's there's something very funny about that. And yes, he describes how comfortable his life was, which having just had, um, having just, yeah. which because this follows a canto where he's talking about, you know, oh God, there's a war coming. Yeah. Hmm. So he describes various um, aspects of, of his life at this point, mm. various places that he went sort of on holiday with his wife. Very carefree. And, yes, and he says, we lived in Birmingham through the slump, line your boots with a piece of paper, sunlight dancing on the rubbish dump, and the queues of men and the hungry chimneys. And the next election came, labor defeats in Erdington and Aston, and life went on, for us went on the same. So there's this, you know, the slump, I, mean, I would assume some kind of economic recession, but I'm not yeah. precisely sure and presumably was not particularly well off financially but mm. was fine right yeah um but that he still wasn't fine that like he was still at the same level even after the election the election didn't help mm. change well, yes anything. that's interesting life went on for us went on the same which you've interpreted as just as badly and i interpreted as but just as well but yeah, but because we lived in Birmingham through the slump, line your boots with a piece of paper. Like those aren't exactly things that you want. Sunlight dancing on oh, the no. rubbish dump. Like, so that for me, like he like cues it up with negative things and then went on the same. Oh, so totally, yeah. Negative. But just before that, he said life was fine. Yeah. yeah and sun true. shone easy, sun shone hard. So I think, I think it's both. I think he's basically mm -hmm. saying, life went on, both the good and the bad. Right, yeah. Which is a very privileged thing to say. That mm. is, there were almost certainly people there for whom that Labour defeat was a much bigger deal. Yeah. You know, there will totally have been people who were much less well off than him. Um, and so whereas he was lining his boots with paper and like, you know, being a bit more careful with his money, other people were unable to pay their rent yeah right like there's that kind of a yeah definitely that kind of a difference uh and yeah and overall i would say this is uh not a very romantic canto right you get mm -hmm. some that Functional, are much more sort of like 
yeah you get a lot of cantos that are like you know oh look at this really beautiful thing and everything's pretty mm. and this has some pretty things but overall it's quite he's describing he's describing it's just very descriptive very yeah it's just yeah like, but he's it's this very is what average it was. this is what it is yeah it's very suburban mm-hmm. right like it, you're right it's very descriptive but it's descriptive of something that isn't sort of um the topic of your average mm. sort of like it's, it's certainly not Virgil's eclogues this is not a pastoral right. poem and I guess maybe you might go as far as say it's just bland like it's just life yeah it's just things yeah, that bland life. yeah 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 he's and then, remembering that and then he switches to 1931 right. and he's got no, no wife, wife <laughs> no ivory tower no funk hole so yes. um, I had to look this up. A funk hole is a safe place of retreat. Mm. So he doesn't have um, anywhere to go that will keep him safe from political and, you know, social upheaval. Mm. Before, Labour was defeated in an election, but life went on the same. Now, life is not going on the same. Mm-hmm. But ultimately... All of this um, education that he's talking about, he kind of, it's kind of not the point of the canto, right? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. he references Virgil and Lizzie, uh, Virgil and Livy, um, the usual round. Like, they're not, you know, yeah. there's nothing special. It's the same thing all the time. That's just what he teaches mm-hmm. and, you know, the point is more about Birmingham. When you get to 10, and so return to work, the MA gown, alphas and betas, central heating, floor polish, the Mostanese on the crown, and Oedipus of Colonus. So the same thing, mm-hmm. going back to Birmingham, talking about all of the same things, it, it makes them less special or seem less special, right? Like, you, yeah. you put classics kind of on a pedestal of like, well, mm. you know, ancient Greek. But to him, you know, it's like, well, it is what it is. I'm teaching it. Yeah. I know about it. It's common knowledge for him. Yeah, it's just part of life. Well, it's not even mm. that it's common knowledge. It's just that it's part of life. Mm. Um, and then he remembers his childhood. So bear in mind, at this point, where it says the war was on, so he must be... Um, Six. Was, did you say six? Yeah, he was six when the war began. Mm-hmm. And let me check. Six when the war be- when the war broke out, and therefore around ten when it ended. So he's between mm-hmm. the ages of about six and ten right. at this point. And he is at Marlborough School. Marlborough. Is it? He's at Marlborough College in Wiltshire. Mm-hmm. So away from home, countryside. Yeah, a boarding school. Mm-hmm. And he's talking about his childhood and his schooling during the First World War. So, would you? How would you compare this to the previous stanza we were just talking about? Because I'd say um... they're on the same theme. I would say that it's pretty similar in the fact that he's just like, it's just describing and like going, talking about all the comings and goings of his experience. And mm-hmm. so in that way, it's kind of the same because he's just describing the life that he lived and, and looking back on it. Although yeah. obviously this is a lot more tinted with like happy things and, yes, like, you know, interesting like discoveries and um because when you're a kid, everything's new. So, like, you know, it's it's probably a lot more exciting that you're, you know, running around outside and you're playing games and you're doing this and that. So, um, yeah, yeah, it, it definitely. But then, you know, the, the other, um, the other canto was was also pretty positive at the start as well. It was happy. Mm-hmm. And it was just, I guess, a different perspective. Yeah. Um, and this, he's not impacted by the war here. He's like, exactly, he, yeah. Yeah, he, he's just like, the war was on, but like, there were things that were noticeable that were different, but he was still, you know, running around. He, we 
had our make believe and we had our mock freedom in walks by season two. So he knew that now he knows that it was, you know, it wasn't as a liberating experience as he remembers it yeah. being, but it's still, you know, it was still easy going. Yeah. So yeah, I'd say this is very sort of tinted by nostalgia mm -hmm. and it's another sort of, um, another catalog of things, our electric mm. torches, our glass dogs and cats and plasticine and conkers, you know, it's, but it's, it's kind of an excited, it's the way yeah. that children talk it's when you ask, yeah, yeah, you ask a child like, oh, what did you do over holidays? It's like, I went to the beach and I made a sandcastle and we had ice cream, <laughs> like it's a, you know, it's an <laughs> yeah. excited list, so it's just and, 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 mm -hmm. um, and yes, he's not sort of, um, as a, he, he, there was a war on, but he wasn't really aware of it. In the same way as right. now, it's the way that he describes growing up. Now he is older, and he is aware of it, and he mm -hmm. can't escape his knowledge that there is a war on. Yeah. Um, but here, and still the acquiring of unrelated facts, a string of military dates for history and the Gospels and the Acts. So that's Bible uh, passages. Mm -hmm. and logarithms and Greek in the essays of Elia, Elia? I don't know, but a Greek, another Greek, mm -hmm. um, and or possibly Roman, I, I forget, and, <laughs> and still the exhilarating rhythm of free movement, swimming or serving at tennis. So he's, the, un, the acquiring of unrelated facts is basically this, he, that, it's kind of his summary of education as a whole. Right. He had that at the beginning of his education and then the further along he you gets, continue. just more and more. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, the, domin the dominant gerundive, which uh, a gerund is um, a grammatical thing. It's a, um, how do you explain it? If you take to sing and you make it singing, that would be, you've, you've made it a gerund. Right. So it's a verb in the form of a noun. Um, or the noun form of a verb. It's sort of a continuous right. thing. It's hard to explain. Um, which makes sense, right, here. In the, uh, like a couple of lines before, the exhilarating rhythm of free movement, swimming or serving at tennis, those are both gerunds. Mm. Um, and yes, so it sort of implies things kind of going on sort of a, a perpetual motion almost, yeah. which if you read um, a, an essay by uh, Melanie White, um, she goes into it a lot. And we, it is just not something that we can get into on this podcast. But if you mm -hmm. want to look at um, the use of um, let me find, let me find the title of that essay. Yeah, Aristotle's concept of energia in Autumn Journal. It's um, Aristotle's sort of theories of like motion and time and like actuality versus potentiality it's all philosophical and complicated and i'd recommend that essay but like right we don't have the time to <laughs> try to get into it here <laughs> um but suffice to say that there is a lot about um movement and action and um sort of continual becoming versus stasis in this poem mm -hmm. And that's kind of partly how he defines education and childhood at this point. Yeah. That it's about continual becoming. It's about just acquiring, you know, facts and abilities and lessons and just keep on moving forward, keep on growing up, keep on acquiring information. Mm. And um, sometimes says here, sometimes a whisper in books would challenge the code, that is the, mm. what he's been brought up to believe. Yeah. A sense oh, of memory. It, it mentions above as well, like, 
then they don't want you to stand on your own they want you to fit mm. the mold and to be channeled yeah. into what the ideal citizen is which is someone who follows the rules and conforms yeah. to the, the norm the norm mm -hmm. uh, sorry i use quotation marks around the norm <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, but yeah so then when it's saying you're you're not you know sometimes there are things that don't fit that code whether it challenge the code or all that kind of stuff but yeah can continue yeah <laughs> but that means um that he is continually it's, it's because he's constantly moving that he doesn't stop to question it too deeply right um you know it's just you know, you start to question the value of what you're learning and then it's mm. like, no, 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 you've got a test now. You've just got to keep going. Yeah, you're going, you're going, yeah. you're going and you're learning and you're learning. And, and that's like how childhood the, works, um, right? Yeah. Mm. I like the, the line that says, and the critic jailed in the mind would peep through the grate and husky from long silence murmur gently that there is something often rotten in the state of Denmark, blah, so on, so on. But like, yeah. you know, like to think that you're in a voice, the one that's sort of, the anarchist or the the person that's not conforming has been pushed mm -hmm. down and down now they're just peeping out and they're yeah. just saying but what about but what about you know it's such a sinister image especially like nowadays and like yeah you know, it's particularly and after relevant. all of these really sort of um nostalgic depictions mm. of school and the, yeah, he remembers kind of it fondly like a bit mm. more sort of like yeah 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 um, and that is kind of, I'd say that's how school still works to some degree. <laughs> yeah, 100 Don't question it too much, you know. Yeah. Uh, and school was what they always said it was, an apprenticeship to life, an initiation, and all the better because the initiates were blindfolded. Mm -hmm. That is, we're being told, this is, your, you know, your, everything you're learning here was getting you ready for life, implying you're not already alive. Yeah, uh, <laughs> applying that and implying that they they give you everything you need to be a good citizen which isn't the case mm, it, it's a no they give you what you need to be a uh i don't know what kind of citizen like a someone who doesn't shake the boat rock the boat or yeah you know and all the better because the initiates were blindfolded that mm. is they don't know what's coming like mm. you don't know what you're being initiated into you're just doing right. what you're told along the way um, and so, yes, this last bit here, um, like life rotating and off sleep as long as things are normal, which it, it, which it was assumed that they would always be, as in, we assumed everything was always mm -hmm. going to be normal, mm -hmm. although you then do have to question, what is normal? Right. Um, on that assumption, terms began and ended, and now, in 1938 AD, term is again beginning. Just use of AD man, why? <laughs> well, he's, he's a classicist, so half of what he studies is BC. Okay, I guess so. <laughs> um, but yeah, this, this sort of term is again beginning. Like, it's it's that collapsing of time mm. that understanding now by looking at the past. Yeah, and taking that sort of so. Uh, it was assumed they, that things would always be normal and now things are not normal mm -hmm. but term is beginning again so maybe yeah. it is normal but yeah. it's not normal there's a war but we're going on as normal right you know and then he's sort of looking back and questioning like we were kind of pigeonholed into these normal situations and, yes and now he's trying to again reconcile the i was taught to how to be normal but then um these situations aren't normal and yeah I we created like... normal by mm -hmm. going by you know they by teaching children this is how things work this is what you should do mm -hmm. you are if if they don't question you and they do uphold what you've just taught them that becomes normal that becomes right. the norm right but then like this new war situation isn't i wouldn't say normal <laughs> like it shouldn't be normal no. why like yeah Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So we haven't yet looked at stanzas nine or 11. So stanza nine mm -hmm. is primarily about philosophy and about classical history. Mm -hmm. So
stanza nine begins, now we are back to normal. Now the mind is back to the even tenor of the usual day, skidding no, long, no longer across the uneasy camber of the nightmare way. We are safe, though others have freshed the railings over the river ravine. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's the same thing. Um, you know, all of this awful stuff is happening over there. Right, and he's just, you know. but then you say over there, I mean, he's potentially putting his head in the sand about it and being like, yeah, it's happening, but not near me, so I'm not gonna worry about it. Yeah, which is, you know, a coping mechanism for hmm. how awful everything is. But it's also um, a privileged thing to be able to do. Yeah, Like he, he It shows his status as someone who is able to put something in a box and set it aside. Absolutely, yeah. Hmm. So he says, October comes with rain ripping around the ankles in waves of white at night and filling the raw, raw clay trenches. The parks of London are a nasty sight, which mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether that's trenches like dug in I the parks of London, dig, like bomb um, shelters. Bomb sh yeah, I think they did dig bomb shelters or they definitely, or did they dig them up for um, planting and, and oh, quite possibly. food? Yeah, I don't, I don't know specifically, but I do recall that a lot of people did um, turn their gardens into like oh, yeah. plots and things. So I'd, I'd assume that parks would also be treated the same way if they're not being used for bomb shelters. Yeah, so. quite possibly. Mm. Yeah. So this is still 1938, bear in mind. But right. either way, yes, um, the parks of London have been dug up. And that's only a few lines after he's just said, now we are back to normal. Right, so clearly they're not that back to normal. You know what? Exactly. It does make you think about um, how things become normal. You know, like mm. when you're seeing something the same every day, it becomes your new normal. So it may yeah. be that he's just been seeing it for so long that he's just like, and now things are back to normal. And then he's like, yeah, this is kind of like, this is what this looks like. And then from the outside, you're like, yeah, that's not normal <laughs> like that's no. very outside what you would anticipate from the situation yeah or that he's telling himself it's normal even though mm. he knows it's not right right so he says in a week i return to work lecturing coaching as impresario of the ancient greeks so this is more stuff about teaching right 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 but it's specifically talking about um you know i said stands eight he doesn't really go into that much detail about what he's teaching Mm. You know, he mentions things, the lost like yeah. the past participles, whatever, but he doesn't go into them in any detail. Here, he's talking about the sort of the culture of the ancient Greeks. Right. And, you know, sort of talks about, um, you know, this sort of, so an impresario is um, the promoter, manager, or conductor of an opera or concert company so i think primarily promoter would be the the word we'd want to use here mm -hmm. he's sort of promoting this this ancient greek culture to his students and you know they wore this cheat on cheat on that you know the mm -hmm. the one you've seen in pictures and on the statues or whatever <laughs> and lived yeah. on fish and olives and talked philosophy or smart and cliques so look they're really interesting and they were really um like learning they're just and, like you <laughs> yeah and they believed in youth and did not close the unpres un un and did not close the unpleasant consequences of age. So goes that they gloss over. So look, you know, they they believed in youth, but they didn't deny what old age is. Um, and you know, all of this. And then, you know, talks about Pindar and Alcibiades, uh, and like you know, the, the like wars, you know, double crossing Athens. Uh, so Alcibiades double crossing As Athens, many died in the city of plague. So he's kind of getting a little bit less positive about them. Yeah, yeah it's kind of forward. like traveling downhill a little. <laughs> yeah, it's like, look, they talked about philosophy and they were honest about old age and Alcibiades. <laughs> Honestly, if you want to know about Alcibiades, watch the um oh god what's it called shit <laughs> i 
watch the over, overly sarcastic productions video about Asabides, um, because that will sum it up far better than I can. He was a weird guy. Uh, but yeah, then he starts talking about plague and drought mm -hmm. and basically how war kind of, kind of ruined um, Athens. It's, right. He sort of has, the, it's sort of a story of decline, I think. It's like, you know, he kind of goes, look how great they are. And then gradually clears some slightly less great things. And then, yeah. then, you know, the eternal factions and reactions of the city state and free speech shivered on the pikes of Macedonia and later on the swords of Rome and Athens became a mere university city. Mm. And Brian Arkins, writes McNeese's subtext is that England now is like this Athens in decline. Right, right. The implication being that that war and the threat of, of fascism and the influence of fascism is going to turn somewhere that was once great, which <laughs> we can debate all day whether Britain was ever great, but you know, right, let's not right. get into that one now. Um, but, but that just as, as Athens was a great city that is now a mere university city, so Britain will be, will, will decline in the same way. And describes them as no longer a race of heroes, but of professors. Uh, which isn't which, necessarily a bad thing, but I guess because well, no, you're, but, you're, no longer, you're no longer the icon, you're just talking about what once happened back in your day, I guess. Yeah, but it's, you know, the professors and crooked businessmen and secretaries and mm. clerks, boring people, basically. All right. Um, and, you know, bear in mind that he was, you know, he was a lecturer. So when he's criticizing professors, he is criticizing himself too, to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, who turned out dapper little elegiac verses on the ironies of fate. You know, how sort of sarcastic, you know. Yeah. The glory that was Greece, put it in a syllabus, grade it page by page to train the like mind, or even to point a moral for the present age. Like he's really kind of getting down imagine. in the dumps about it. He's really yeah. getting like, and then it's this now, and it's ruined, and he hates. Like he almost appears to hate it, to resent yeah. it, what it's become. Yeah, which if we're taking Brian Arkin's view that this is an analogy for Britain. It's becoming, it's, it's him be beginning to hate Britain. Like, look, we could have been great. And, you know, it's not, not going, um, you know, we're not upholding what we say that we uphold. We're just becoming sort of boring and complacent, I think is probably the, the, the main accusation. Yeah, definitely complacent. Yeah. You know, and actually there's something like, about it. That's the thing. Yeah. There's something ironic about the um, the glory that was Greece put it in a syllabus graded page by page because what do we learn about in in history now? Mm. Exactly this period of British history and yeah, you put it in a syllabus and Greece. you write essays and get them graded. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but uh, there's this, he says that they are, that ancient Greece was, ancient Greece was perceived as Models of logic and lucidity, dignity, sanity, the golden mean between opposing ills, which is a reference to Aristotle's uh, virtue ethics, his mm -hmm. theory. And then though there were exceptions, of course, but only exceptions, the bloody Bacchanals on the Thracian hills. So the Bacchanal is um, a festival of Bacchus, which is the yeah. Roman name for Dionysus, the god of wine, madness, etc., mm -hmm. which were... Um, uh, well, I'll read this. Uh, to you from Wikipedia. Livy, writing some 200 years after the event, offers a scandalised and extremely colourful account <laughs> of the Bacchanalia. Modern scholars take a sceptical approach to Livy's allegations of frenzied rites, sexually violent initiations mm. of both sexes, all ages and all social classes, and of the cult being a murderous instrument of conspiracy against the state. Um, and actually, I'm reading Ovid's, uh, or Ovid's Metamorphosis at the moment, mm -hmm. and um, there are references to Bacchus in the same way that's like mm. uh, people getting, uh, you know, sort of rights in honour of uh, Bacchus ending in people getting torn to shreds. Yeah, so I've heard of Bacchanals. Yeah, from yeah. like, like big, 
sex festivals that then become murder festivals. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, but he's saying the only exceptions are these people, but I'm like, um, no, there's plenty of bad people knocking about, but like, he's just mm. choosing some very specific, very bad examples. Well, yeah, that's the thing. I don't think he is saying that these are the only exceptions. He's saying that these are the only except, like, that we, we only acknowledge those exceptions and we call them exceptions as opposed to oh, just okay. other parts of culture. Yeah. It's this theme of order and disorder that there's mm. this natural, like, order to the world. And it's definitely not. Science says Yeah, otherwise. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like, just looking around at the way that mm. this sort, of, sort of society works, this is also yeah. the sort of conservative idea of, you know, every, but there's this social hierarchy and everyone fits neatly in their bit. And if you earn your way to the top, then you can, then, you know, if you reach the top, it's because you've earned it. And it's like, if you start not at that. the bottom, the world you can work, work like your way up. But absolutely like, not. No. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and he sort of mentions um, the humanist in his room with Jacobean panels, chewing his pipe. Um, chops the ancient world to turn a sermon to the greater glory of God. So he takes a pagan society mm -hmm. and cuts out the bits he likes and uses it else. to make a Christian point. Yes. <laughs> you know, he's sort of talking about just how badly we've, we misrepresent the ancient world. Mm. Um, and how, and that, you know, again, if we're taking this and comparing it to, um, or using it as an analogy, for England at the time, um, we can make a point about what happens to history, that any once great society mm. is going to be misrepresented later. Yeah. Or that there's going to be a fall from a great society yeah. to something new. It may not be something mm -hmm. bad new, but you know, ancient Greece is called ancient because it happened so long ago and that's something, you know, it's not it's not it anymore. We're, we're not that yeah. anymore. So, yeah. And also, we talk about ancient Greece. Like, not once here has he mentioned modern Greece. Like, no. this still exists. Right. <laughs> That's what I was going to say when he was like, the glory that was Greece. Greece is still yeah. a nice place, okay? There's still people that live yeah. there and have a good time there. And it's, you know, like... Yeah. Hmm. And so what if England is then taken in the same way? That is, what hmm. if... What if... Hitler wins this war and right. England becomes a fascist, um, so a fascist state run mm. by Hitler and everything is ruined basically, you know, all the mm. things, all of his, what he refers to as his civilised values right. don't apply anymore. Yeah. What if England falls in that way? what happens to all the, the, the regular people and the regular yeah. society with the and things to all that of we the stuff that regular. he holds. Yeah, and to mm -hmm. all the stuff that he holds is really important. Mm -hmm. um, all of the great writers and whatever, that right. will we still have their works? Will we study them as a thing of the past? Now again, it's putting mm -hmm. a lot of importance on England that I don't think we really deserve. <laughs> <But, laughs> yeah. yeah, okay, yeah, I accept that. That is a good point. <laughs> But it is sort of an interesting way, an interesting thing to consider that he is on the precipice of war, like mm. the first, the Second World War is beginning. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like there's anything he can do to stop it. And it's like, what's going to happen? Is our society, is this the downfall of our society? Is this the end of the world that yeah. I know? Yeah, he seems very concerned about, about this. Yeah, understandably. <laughs> Yeah, true. Um, but then maybe he's taking a more of a dramatic flair to it in terms of like, I don't think the everyday person is going to be like, what will happen to my place in the world? It's like, I well, think for him, if war's maybe, been declared, I think you would be. But not necessarily your place in the world, but like more, I feel like a lot more people would be like, will I survive this experience? But he seems oh, yeah, worried fair. about, but what about the literature and the art? And all the things we know of history, like maybe it shows his like privileged standing again. Like yeah, he's maybe. not having he's not having to worry necessarily about 
you know where he's going to live or you know whether he's going to have to be moved somewhere or you know that mm. kind of, whether he's going to have fair. a job so yeah i think that maybe he's he's lamenting on things that maybe wouldn't be important to a more working class person yeah that's fair yeah so if we finish up this little section mm -hmm. with these last few lines which i really like so and when i should remember the paragons of hellas that's greece mm -hmm. i think instead of the crooks the adventurers the opportunists the careless athletes and the fancy boys the hair splitters the pedants the hard-boiled skeptics and the agora which is like a marketplace sort of and the noise of the demagogues the demagogues are um, a leader who makes use of popular prejudices and false claims and promises in order to gain power, um, or a leader championing the cause of the common people in ancient times. Um, and the quacks and the women pouring libations over graves, libations being uh, uh, liquid, usually wine used as a sacrifice to mm -hmm. deity. And the trimmers at Delphi and the dummies at Sparta, and lastly, I think of the slaves. And how one can imagine oneself among them, I do not know. It was all so unimaginably different and all so long ago. Okay, good for you. <laughs> well, it's, I think it's interesting because he knows what he, like, there's a version of Greece that he is teaching his students mm. about Plato mm -hmm. and Aristotle and Homer and Sophocles and Euripides and Aeschylus. Aeschylus, however you pronounce his name. All of these, um, you know, famous philosophers and writers, and there'll be generals as well, um, and politicians, Demosthenes, all these people. Mm -hmm. And clearly, he ha he values them. He keeps referencing them all the time. Right, right. And clearly, he thinks there is something to be learned from them. But he is more interested on a personal level in the ordinary people mm. and the people who he is not supposed to be interested in the underdogs he's not supposed to be rooting for them right um you know ordinary people women pouring libations that 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 is women doing ordinary things their tasks their daily tasks in right. the society they lived in <coughs> and you know the opportunists, the adventurers, all these people who are not really, who they're not paragons of virtue, you know. Right, right. And lastly, the slaves. We forget, <laughs> like, we don't, when we talk about integrity, we, yeah. we don't talk about the fact that they had slaves. Yes. <laughs> you know, our democracy, the word democracy comes from a Greek word, demos meaning the people, and um, the crossy bit. Uh, Krato is to hold is like I hold sway or I have power over. Mm. So it is so democracy rule of the people, and we sort of go yeah like democracy it began in ancient Greece and we've like but they still have people that this yeah yeah like we've inherited this great tradition of democracy from the Greeks and it's like they had slaves mm. and the demos the people who had power you know, who had the power to vote on what they wanted to do were men who owned property over the age of 30, I think. It was a very narrow group of people. Right. And, you know, we're encouraged to, but, you know, when you're learning about history, there's a certain amount of, like, imagine yourself in the in ordinary, in ordinary people's shoes, except that we're not taught about the ordinary people. We're taught about the right, great people. Right, right. How is... Um, you know, how were you supposed to imagine yourself? You can imagine yourself among... Hang on, hang on, I need to pause. My laptop is just okay. about to die. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm going to pause this recording. Let me zoom. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, we, you know, we kind of forget that, that ancient Greece and ancient Rome were societies that owned slaves. And we are not in any way encouraged to imagine ourselves as them. Right. And it's... Because they would be yeah. the normal people. The slaves would be the normal working people in some cases. But they weren't perceived. They, were, they weren't seen that way. Yeah, true. 
like as he says it's, it was all so unimaginably different we can't mm. and also long ago but actually not that long ago mm. in the grand scheme of things that there was a slave trade of you know yeah right people kidnapped from africa like this idea of owning people as property mm. is not new. nowhere near as old but yeah, also as not that we old. would like to think it is. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it's but the thousands of years ago. I didn't catch but, a word of that last bit. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so when he says it was also unimaginably different and also long ago, mm -hmm. he's right that ancient Greece and Rome were so long ago and, and it is pretty much impossible to fully comprehend the just how different mm. culture would have been. Yeah. But when he, you know, when he says, I think of the slaves, it's not that long ago that people owned slaves. Yeah. Like more of human history seems to have had slaves than did. Right, right. Um, so yeah, it's just it's just interesting. I don't have like a a, a grand point to make. Mm -hmm. It's just um an interesting thing to consider that like that it even occurs to him to imagine, to try to imagine himself among the slaves, even though he says that he, he can't do it, like he can't yeah. imagine it. The fact that it even occurs to him suggests a disconnect or a difference between him and other, and the, and at least, well, a disconnect between him and his perception, at least, of other people in his field. Mm. That he's, that, that other classicists are, you know, because he says, when I should remember the paragons of Hellas, as in when everyone else is talking about them and they're really imp and saying they're important, and I feel like I should be thinking of them, mm -hmm. I'm actually thinking of all these other people, including the slaves. Yeah, and trying to understand that and trying to imagine myself among them, and I can't do it. But he's the fact that it occurs to him mm. makes it different. Yeah, definitely. So, how long have we been recording for now? I don't know, but it's five o'clock, so probably just over an hour, maybe? Okay, should we skip the only other um, stands? The only one we haven't looked at yet is 11, mm -hmm. which is just him talking about, um, presumably Nancy, the woman he was in a relationship with, and to be honest, that, like... It's much of the same of the descriptions and life's comings and goings. Yeah, mm. yeah it's not really, we don't need to look at it now. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, sure. So is that, so yeah, that's part yeah. two done. Uh-huh, so nice um, one. if we want to leave it there, do you want to talk about what we're doing next time? I would love to. Um, so this is part two. So next, after this episode, the science episode will be how wartime affects um, epidemiology and disease and things like that, um, but in a historical setting. So mm -hmm. um, not how wartime is currently affecting people because there are um, some countries that are definitely suffering right now in terms of disease and war, um, but we're going to look at it in a more historical setting, just uh, since we talked about the Greeks and things, it might be interesting to see how their take on disease and such. Mm -hmm. So that's what we will be looking at next time to give you a little bit of science. Great. Yeah. Oh, and uh, Merry Christmas for those who it's relevant to. <laughs> oh yeah. Because uh, our other next episode will be out after that. Happy holidays to everyone it isn't relevant to. I hope you have a pleasant break uh if you get a break if not i'm so sorry <laughs> <laughs> but yeah 
that's it for this week. Thank you very much, yeah. Esme. <laughs> See you next time.